I don't have very many notes this morning. I'm going to try to keep it as short as I can. But if you'll turn with me to 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. We're going to be hearing a lot from the Apostle Paul this morning. I was talking with somebody this week and this scriptures or a couple of these scriptures came to mind, but it caused me to look into them a little bit more. Just felt like this was the direction that the Lord was leading me in. We know the scriptures in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, the eighth and ninth verses very well. We're very familiar with them. They come to us many times. It says, but we are, tr-, or the eighth verse says, we are troubled on every side. Yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Now I want to go back to the seventh verse here for just a moment. It says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power... Now, I want to break that down for just a moment here. We, being on this earth, being humans that were created from the dust of this earth, living here in our day to day lives that we go through now, have this treasure, have this assurity, have this confidence to know that the excellency of the power. I don't know about you, but I can't say that I have excellency of power. (laughs) And if you question that, let's go cut a few trees down for a few days. (laughs) Let's go finish some concrete with Brother Hector. (laughs) And you'll figure out real quickly where your power falls short. (laughs) Because unless you're used to doing those things... Your body does not have the strength to continue on doing those things, but for short periods of time. And what I have found myself this week over and over and over again is feeling the sense of falling short because the abilities that I have, the power that I have, wasn't enough to get done what needed to be done. Am I saying that I was a failure this week? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that as I was, went to do a task, I gave it everything that I have and I put my all into it. And because I put everything that I had to give to it, into it, I can say that I don't feel like a failure. I feel like I did the best that I could. But I was reminded again and again and again, my abilities will not be able to accomplish the greater goal. There is nothing that I can do of myself to get things done the way that the Lord needs them done. So you see the excellency of power that's here in verse 7 that Paul is referring to. It's something that we don't possess. In fact, he goes on to say in that very sentence, That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You see that scripture right there before we ever even get into the fact that we can be persecuted but not forsaken and cast down but not destroyed. And we can go through these things but not be overcome by these things. That scripture in the seventh verse should give us hope. Because it's not of our own strength. It's not of our own abilities that we're going to be able to accomplish things. So we don't have to put our confidence in ourselves. We don't have to put our confidence in each other. But we can put our hope and our trust in the Lord today. Because He is where the power comes from. And He has not failed us. He is still on the throne here today. But brother Christopher, you just don't understand the things that I'm going through. 
I do feel like I've been cast down. I do feel like I've been destroyed. I do feel like I've been forsaken. Like I'm just here on my own. Not able to carry on any longer. Well let me explain something to you. In studying these scriptures this week. One of the things I found. Was that Paul wrote this. And if you study Paul's life at all. Let me. Let me. Give you a little bit of understanding here. There was no point in time after Paul's conversion, after Saul's conversion where he became Paul, that Paul had what we would know as an easy life. (laughs) There were moments that he may have been in jail, that he may have been facing death, persecution. And there were other moments that he may not have been in that bad of a situation. But even still in the moments that it wasn't that bad, Paul didn't have an easy life. He was constantly laboring. He was constantly working for the Lord. He was constantly suffering persecutions on behalf of what he was trying to accomplish for the Lord. So what what you've got to understand and realize is when Paul wrote this in the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians, this was a moment when he wasn't facing the worst Of the worst conditions. He was going through life. Normal life. Church, we get in the midst of easy days. And on those easy days, we can look and we can say, Oh, God's been so faithful to me. He's been so good to me and I'm so so glad that God's been faithful through everything. I can put my trust and my confidence in Him because I know He won't fail us. But then it's the hard days that come along when everything seems to fall apart that we step back and we say, God, why have You forsaken me? (laughs) Why have you given up on me? Why aren't you here to help me? Why aren't you here to give me the strength that I need? The guidance that I need? You see, Paul was in the midst of one of the easy days when he wrote this. But let's go to one of Paul's hard days. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, the first first chapter. We're going to start at the 8th verse. Paul wrote, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. (laughs) This is the exact opposite statement of what Paul said later in the fourth chapter. We were cast down but not destroyed. We were, we were persecuted but not forsaken. We were distressed but we weren't in despair. But three chapters earlier, in studying this, Paul was in prison again. Or was referring to a time when he was in prison, when he was facing quite probably a death sentence yet again. He was saying, we were pressed beyond measure. We were in great despair. Church, what I want you to realize this morning is not that life is always going to be so easy that we can constantly step back and look at it and say, I have been persecuted, but I've never been forsaken. I have been cast down, but I've never been destroyed. I've I've been perplexed, but never distressed. There are those days that come along when we feel pretty good that we can say that. But there are also those days that we're standing there, just as Paul wrote here in the first chapter, saying, we were distressed. We were in despair of life itself. We didn't know if we were going to make it anymore. We didn't know how to go forward. We didn't know what to do next or where to turn to next. I didn't know what what was going to happen. 
But you see, Paul didn't stop there even in the first chapter of 2 Corinthians. He kept going. And we can read it uh, in the ninth verse. He said, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by praying by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Paul wrote a lot of words here. And if I'm being honest, when I read this this week and was going through these scriptures and looking at them a little bit more, I felt about like Brother Nick says a lot of times reading our Sunday school lessons. What in the world is he trying to say? What is Paul trying to get at with all these words? Well, what Paul was trying to get at was we were at the end of our ropes. We were distressed. We didn't know if we were going to make it any farther. We didn't know what was going to happen. We were pressed beyond what we could reasonably stand anymore. We were ready to give up. But even though in ourselves we had nothing more than a death sentence. Because of our own abilities, of our own strengths, we could not make it anymore. What Paul was saying was because our hope was in God, we could keep on going. Because our hope was in the One who would not fail, who delivered us from sin, and will continue to deliver us through the things that we go through in this life. Church, what I want to get across to you this morning is the fact that you don't have to be what gets you through every situation. Because sooner or later, your strength is going to come up short. You're not going to be able to have the strength to stand there for, as Paul wrote about in another chapter. But what we can do here this morning is have confidence to know that no matter what we go through, we can put our hope and trust in the One who delivered us from sin and who will continue to deliver us again and again and again. I'm just going to be honest with you. If my hope was in me... I would have a very bleak outlook on life. Because even though God has blessed me with the ability to do some many different things. You know that old statement? Jack of all trades and a master of none. That's me. God has given me the ability and the knowledge to get myself in trouble in a whole lot of different ways. But in all of that, I would still fall short. And I know I would fall short because I don't have the ability to do what only God can do. But church, when I go back and I say, my hope is not in me. My hope is not in you. As much as I love you and as much as I have confidence in you, I made that comment about Sister Shanna just being able to stare into your soul, not even know anything's going on, but she can just pick up on something and like that, she's figured out something's wrong and and you just need somebody to be a friend, to talk to for a moment. But you see, even in saying all that, and I appreciate the times that Sister Shanna does that for me, If my hope was simply in Sister Shanna getting me through life's problems, I would come up short. Because as much as I love her, as much as she is a blessing, she is a help, she can't come through on everything and do what God can do for me. What we've got to realize, church, is 
When we're looking to one another, and I'm not saying this to say, don't you call me when you're in trouble. Don't you text me when you need prayer or you need help. That's not at all what I'm saying. Please text me. I want to pray for you. I want to, if you need to call me, call me and talk to me. But if you're coming to me looking for me to be able to help you in that situation, I can't do it. <laughs> The only thing I can do is pray for you. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to go back to God. And you're going to have to get a hold of Him and get what you need. Because He's the one that's going to be able to get you through the things that you're going through. He's the one that's going to give you the strength to carry on. But guess what? He's not going to give it to me to then come and say, oh, Here you go, brother Nick. God gave me this for you. That's not how God works. God's waiting for Brother Nick to come up to get, get where he needs to be and say, God, I need you in this moment so that God can come directly to you, Brother Nick. He doesn't have to come to me. He doesn't have to work through me. But He'll come straight to you in your moment of need and be there to prove Himself faithful to you. But how do we do this? It, it's hard. <laughs> let, me, let me just... <laughs> I've been honest all morning. May as well keep being honest. I don't care that I'm a pastor. There's days that it's still burdensome for me and hard for me to keep going on. Why? Because the weight of this life is heavy to carry. <laughs> the things that the enemy puts on us are heavy to carry. It doesn't mean that I'm exempt from it. But what I want to tell you this morning is there's a way to continue carrying on. And you have to do it for yourself because I can't. But Paul, in writing to Timothy in, in 2 Timothy, the first chapter, gave us a great example. We know these scriptures so well. The first chapter, starting at the fifth verse, says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. And I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Paul told Timothy, and if you don't get anything else out of this message this morning, you listen to this part right here really good. Paul told Timothy to stir up the gift that is within him. As most everybody knows, we had a bonfire over at the house on Friday evening. That quickly, we decided to end because rain came down on us. And even though there was a nice warm bonfire there, none of us really particularly liked to get wet. So we came on back inside and it wasn't a big pile of wood or anything at that point. It was raining. So we just kind of let it go. We fellowshiped for a while and as everybody was leaving Friday night, I walked outside and checked on it. And it was just burning real small, real low to the ground. Wasn't worried about it. And, and I don't know if anybody else is like me. But I don't like to have a bunch of tree limbs and brush and everything else sitting in my yard. So I said, well, I'm just going to let it burn. I'm going to let it go. I'm not going to put water on it. It'll keep on going just real small and real, real contained. And it'll burn it all down to ash. To where then I can just roll my mower over it. And I'm good to go. So that's what I did. Saturday morning I got up and I walked outside to check on everything and it wasn't smoking anymore. It wasn't burning anymore. It was just a pile of ash there. A couple little twigs. I think one tree limb left sitting there that hadn't burnt. But I said, okay, it's taken care of. Well, I went on about my morning. Me and uh, Brother Jordan did a couple things. He helped me out with a couple things and we came back inside and we ate lunch for a while and we sat around on the couch and we 
watched some football on TV for a little while. And about 3.30 or 4 o'clock yesterday, I went back outside and cut down a couple more trees and threw some more brush on that pile. And I saw the pile still had some coals left in it. But I said, I ain't worried about it. I'm just going to throw some brush on the pile. And we'll burn it in a couple weeks. And we put some brush on the pile and put a little bit more brush on the pile and put a little bit more brush on the pile. And in a couple minutes, I looked up and I said, hey, there's smoke coming from that pile. And a couple more minutes went by. And I looked over and said, hey, Sarah, the fire's back. (laughs) And before I knew it, we had bonfire part two last night at our house. That it just kept on burning and kept on burning and kept on burning. In fact, the bonfire we had last night at the house was bigger than the one we had Friday night at the house. Why do I say all that? I'm telling you this wonderful story. Because I didn't stand there with a lighter and try to light this brush back on fire. I didn't stand there with some lighter fluid and spray on it and try to get it good and soaked with that so I could light it on fire. The only thing I did was throw some brush on the pile. And when it stirred up those hot coals, fire began to come, began to come back. And it began to ignite that brush. And it grew and it grew and it grew. Church, let me tell you something this morning. If you will go back and you will stir up that gift, it may feel like it's gone out. It may feel like it's over. It's done with. You don't see the smoke anymore. You don't feel the heat from it anymore. I could walk all around that pile of ashes and I didn't feel heat. I didn't feel any smoke. There was nothing left there. But when the brush stirred up those coals and got down underneath of the top layer, it immediately began being red hot again and started that fire back. Church, you can have a fire started back in your life. What Paul was telling to Timothy here was not that you just need to go out and start a new fire, but what he was saying was you need to go back and revive the fire that was once started in you. Church today, let me tell you something. The fact that you are sitting here this morning, the fact that I have been your pastor for a year now, a little bit over a year, and we have experienced the services we have, I know that there is a fire that has been burning inside of each and every one of you. Now, I also know that over time, that fire gets bigger and brighter and hotter, and sometimes it comes back down and gets dimmer and colder, and it begins to just kind of smolder there. But church, what I want to tell you this morning is we don't need a new fire to come back on us, but we need to go back and revive the fire that was once started in us and get it burning hot again. If you feel cold, if you feel like these things are overcoming you, overtaking you, Go back and stir the fire up and get it burning again that God can come and do what He wants to do. How does that happen? It happens by the song that we just sang. Go back and have a little talk with Jesus. When things are going wrong, when things are going bad, go back to the One who can make a difference. Have that little talk with Him to say, Lord, I need Your help. I can't make it much longer. I can't keep going. And He will come on the scene. And He will be there for you. Now there's a part of this story that I've left out. We had put some brush on this pile. And I was using the grapple on my tractor to reach in the woods and grab big piles of brush and bring it and dump it out on that pile. But it just so happened that I had taken the grapple off and put a different attachment on. And I went back and I had to put the grapple back on. 
If you've ever worked with heavy machinery, you know that when you pick up those implements and those attachments, there's locks that you have to go back and put on them. Doesn't mean that you can't lift them, it just means that they're not secure till you get those locks on them. And guess what I forgot to do? Was put those locks down on it. So as I lifted this big pile of brush up out of the woods and I moved it over to the pile, I took it and I opened that grapple up to dump it and began to tilt my bucket forward. And as I tilted, this 600 pound grapple fell off the front of my tractor. Right in the middle of that brush pile. (laughs) Why is that important? Why did I need to tell you that fact? Well, first off, probably to humble myself just a little bit. (laughs) But it wasn't until the weight pushed the brush down on the coals that the fire was able to ignite. If you've ever done much burning of brush or anything else, sometimes you've got to get a shovel or a rake or something else and take your brush and push it down onto those coals so that it can light and get it hot enough, down close to it enough that it'll actually begin to burn. How does that affect us spiritually? Church, what we've got to realize and what we've got to understand is sometimes when we feel the greatest weight being pressed down on us, the Lord's just trying to get us a little closer to those coals. That He can reignite that fire again. That He can come and we can see that big, wonderful flame build up again. That it can revive in us and do what the Lord would have it to do. Stand with me this morning, church. As I said, I've been your pastor for a little over a year now. But it really wouldn't matter if I had been or not. I can tell every person that watches this online. I could walk into any church at any place that I wanted to. And I could tell you that your spiritual life, that fire that's burning within you, has times that it goes up and gets bigger. And it has times that it goes down and begins to simmer down and smolder. That's just the way it happens. But what I'm telling you this morning is church, it's time to stir up that gift that God has given to us. It's time to stir up the fire that He placed inside of us and revive it that it can burn brightly again, that it can burn hot again, that it can take care of the imperfections, the infirmities, the things that are causing us to look a little bit less than what God would have us to be. But it's only going to come through first of all, us having the determination that we're going to stir it up And then just to go ahead and brace yourself for it. When the weight comes down on us so hard that it gets us close enough to the coals. That the heat is there to be applied. And to get us going again. Sister Shannon, come to the piano if you would.